to get rich. And really, um, I mean, really, isn't every presentation, every, everything about either how to make money, how to save money, how to make your life better? Um, I'm going to narrow it down a little bit to just related to programming. And it's mainly based on my experience. And really, um, it's not so much that I'm sharing this with you because I'm so rich. It's more I'm doing this presentation for me just as much as for you. Uh, but simple concept of economics here. All it takes for you to have a condition is when you know something that your client doesn't know or that they want and they're willing to pay for, and you can give it to them at a, at a value that's worth it to them. Uh, notice that you only need to know a little bit more than your client. You don't need to be the super guru in everything. In fact, they don't care if you are. They just want to know that you've got something that a value that they can use and maybe make money. Um, and just take, for example, I wanted to take a picture one day, so I signed up for photo school. I got a degree. Four years later, well, six years later, I, uh, I can take a better picture than if I hadn't gone to school. But do you need to take that approach on everything? No, of course not. Um, and as we know, Rami said, you do the project with the developer that you have, not the developer that you wish you might have or that you might have in the future. You might not want to use that line to your client when things aren't really going well, but it really is a reality. Every, every project is a, is a matter of trade-offs. And, and I wanted to say perfection's overrated, but it's really more like being too specific is a problem. And I just found this picture, and I thought it was pretty awesome because my, we have that, or my mom has this, and my kid swears this is a Photoshopped picture, which I don't think so, just for some reason. I'm not sure why. It looks like it could have been, but anyway. Um, I, I ran into this uh, student who was graduating, I think it was from the Art Institute, and he said that he's going to be specializing in you know, hair modeling with water reflective, you know, very esoteric, specific thing, which maybe you can do that. I, I don't really know that industry, but I don't think programmers can do that. You can't say this is the stack I'm going to use because this is the coolest thing. Um, you, just, you don't do it in that order. You don't want to be perfect at everything or a, you know, to know everything before you start or you'll have that problem of the photographer who goes to school first before you can take a picture. Um, now, and I, wanna, I don't want to get down on being a craftsman. I, I just realized uh, Ward wrote the foreword of this. I, I almost went and took the picture of the real book because I do have it and I love this book and I have nothing against being a craftsperson. But unless you've been to the point where your code is so embarrassing to you that you're sort of ashamed of it, then you can't really appreciate it when things are going smoothly. I mean, you sometimes are working on stuff and everything goes smoothly and it's, you can refactor and you're just sitting back watching it hum along. Uh, but more often it's more like a movie where the world's about to explode and if you don't get this code in there. And so I guess what I look at this just being, to me, so old, I think, you know, is code accelerating? Is, is the way people need to learn changing? And okay, it's totally changing in a lot of ways. But I think beyond this idea that you have to constantly be learning and, you know, this is kind of an obvious thing. But what's happening more, I think, is that you have to be accepting not knowing everything. You have to just plug in these things and, you know, be ready for it to sort of fall apart and not, and not work. So you just want to be on the edge of things actually working. Um, but I come back to this just because I remember a long time ago someone showed me... Um, they were demonstrating x-rays, and they said, no, no one would make this kind of x-ray you know, with um, materials and stuff unless you can make a lot of money, you can save money, or you can save a life. And, and really, I think that everything kind of comes down to that. So if, if you put the, the value that you're providing to your client in those terms, you're going to have a lot better time selling an R, ROI. And yes, you can add artistic expression. You can't add because uh, it's neat. That's not a justification for a project. Um, so I've got an acronym you can't remember, uh, PPHR. The, P stands for people. Um, now, I, apparently there was an issue with this font. Somebody was complaining about it. Um, it's, not, it's not that funny of a joke to, the wrong, to this crowd. But some people will yelling, there's a problem, and I've got a, a prop for you if you did. But just in case I have this. Um, okay, well, people. You go to where people are. People hire people. There's no other way to get a job besides talking to people. Uh, you, you do need to know more, just a little bit more than the client, but that's not to say you don't need any skills. You need to have some proficiency. And this is a really subtle thing. When you're talking and when you're writing, putting things in the present tense, active voice, just, just having a command on your communication makes a huge difference when you're trying to sell yourself to a, to a client. I, again, I should roll back way back. I'm basing this on being a self-employed programmer. So it's a different market than, than some of you may be. A um, good way to learn is to, to do stuff just a little bit beyond your current capability. And be realistic. Say no a lot. Say no to your client's crazy idea. I mean, they, they need to be told the, the honest truth. You don't want a doctor who tells you um, you're going 
you know, everything's fine when actually there's a problem. You know, you want to say no. Say no to your own creativity when it's someone else's dime. You know, you don't want to go spending all this time on something they can't appreciate. Uh, and just saying no to the, to the wrong clients when it's not a good match. Um, finally, you want to always be prospecting. And, and I just mentioned this because you guys need a handbill. Some people don't even have a business card. I've got this stupid thing I hand out. You're welcome to take it. It's kind of fun. But um, if you can't promote yourself, I mean, a handbill is an easy way to promote yourself. So that's, that's my talk. Uh, this is what I already said. I think I said all that stuff. And then we'll go to the next person here. So, thanks. So it's Nathan, and do you want five minutes, or? Okay. Am I uh, hooking this up right here? We good? Cool. Can I just use the uh, buttons there? Yeah, we can do that. Cool, cool, cool. Hi, uh, I'm Nate. Really enjoying this conference. It's been awesome. Uh, I want to uh, tell you a bit about a project that's somewhat node-related, maybe not necessarily, but I think it would be of interest to uh, a lot of people here. I've been calling it Peer Pouch. And uh, what Peer Pouch is, is it's a combination of PouchDB and WebRTC. Maybe a quick show of hands. Uh, who's heard of WebRTC? Probably a lot of us. Um, PouchDB? Cool, cool. Um, so just uh, in case somebody hasn't, uh, and just so we're kind of all on the same page here, uh, PouchDB uh, lets you store JSON documents, binary attachments uh, in the browser. It's a JavaScript library that runs pretty much anywhere. Um, you can retrieve these JSON documents and binary attachments via key, or you can do like MapReduce indexing or spatial indexing on them. Uh, you can replicate data between databases. We'll get back to that shortly. Um, this is, if you're familiar with CouchDB, these first three bullet points probably sound really familiar. PouchDB is CouchDB in the browser. Actually, it's also PouchDB in Node.js. Um, WebRTC, real-time communications is the RTC part for the web. Uh, it's audio video chat. If I had like cool transitions or a laser pointer, I would be slashing through audio video chat because uh, what I'm using WebRTC for, really isn't phone calls or, or chat. Uh, I'm using the direct data connection that it also offers. Um, in a sense, you can think of WebRTC as WebSockets meets peer-to-peer. -peer. It lets you set up a direct uh, data connection between two browsers, basically, uh, without needing to you know, poke holes in firewalls and whatnot. Well, we'll get a bit into that later. But uh. So peer pouch. Combines the two, mostly just for the love of it, um, because I think it's a, a great combo. Peer Pouch is meant to just let you talk with a remote PouchDB instance. So PouchDB runs in the browser. Why not let users' browsers connect directly to each other and replicate this data, keep, keep two peers' databases in sync? Does this via WebRTC? It works via PouchDB. And I'd like to explain that a little bit more. Um, WebRTC um, enables peer-to-peer -peer communication, but there's some setup. I think that was covered in one of the little earlier talks. You need to do some setup via a more centralized hub um, to set up this connection. Just simple peer discovery, right? Like a browser can't really just like port scan the local network, right? You're not, they're not going to allow JavaScript to do that. <laughs> Um, so you need peer discovery. Uh, there's some NAT piercing for if like the two clients are behind different firewalls and stuff, just to deal with all that. That's done over a central hub. Um, you need to communicate. The client says, hey, I want to give you an offer to connect to me. You have to get this offer to connect, this invitation to connect, to the peer. Well, CouchDB changes is great for communication. I put an asterisk by that because it is and it isn't, but it, it certainly can be used for that. Uh, the changes feed of CouchDB basically lets you get the most recent, well, changes to your database. Uh, you can long pull that you can, or, or watch it continuously. Um, so it's great for like sending messages, right? Uh, if, if one peer drops an invitation in 
a database, the other peer can receive notification of that pretty quick. And so we can use that to send all this setup information that we need to make the direct conversation. PouchDB is already, currently, it talks to, you can make a PouchDB instance that talks to, say, a centralized HTTP um, uh, centralized database. So um, what we can actually do is let PeerPouch lets you use any PouchDB database to set up its own like database in instance connections. Um, so you could actually, because it's, it's, it's implemented in a kind of generic fashion, once you get one peer connection set up where you're accessing a PouchDB instance on a peer's machine, if you've got two people accessing that same peer database, they could use that kind of to, to set up more connections. Um, I don't really, I, I haven't fully like done the math or drawn it out, but it, it almost seems as if because it's kind of self-hosting in that sense, that uh, you could sort of set up a fragile decentralized mesh network of these uh, like browser databases where one client chucks data in their database that gets replicated to a remote database that's been set up with another remote peer-to-peer -peer database. Um, could be kind of fun. Um, and that's really kind of uh, the reason I've been working on this. So I've got the hub plugin working. I've got the connection setup is all working. We, we can set up a data channel uh, using, we can use CouchDB as the signaling server in, in WebRTC terms to set up a data connection. Uh, I've got to start on doing the actual RPC. There's a couple little issues that are, that are need to get worked through um, on making it actually somewhat safe. But uh, so it's not actually working, I have to admit. But I think it's kind of cool. Uh, love, love your enthusiasm, help contributions. <laughs> um, and uh, one of the cool things that might be neat is PouchDB runs in Node.js. And there are, I've, I did a quick search you know, through NPM. And uh, it looks like there are actually like WebRTC wrappers you know, that you can NPM install and use WebRTC. So that'd be kind of cool to kind of set up a more peer-to-peer -peer data connection. Um, uh, so if you have any questions, I know it's, uh, the, the idea is kind of it could enable a bit more collaborative uh, web apps. Oh, and uh, so yeah. So if, if you have any questions, uh, I'm on Twitter, or you can find my email address there. Um, there's a URL for the project if you're interested. Thank you, guys. Hello. OK, so we did get those to-go containers up here, if anybody wants to grab that. We're going to be breaking down the stuff right after the lightning talks, and, and anything that's not uh, taken home is going to go away and hopefully find another home, but maybe find a trash can. So if you wanted food, uh, now's the time to go grab it. Thanks. OK. OK. Hello. Uh, my name is Justin. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about Git streams. Uh, Gitstreams is uh, an email that gets sent to you uh, that shows the um, kind of what's happened on GitHub uh, over the past day. One of the issues I have with GitHub is that the activity feed is useless. My, my work account fills up my entire, uh, my entire activity feed, and I miss like the one commit on the project that uh, I care about. Um, GitHub has some, some facilities for getting around this, but they tend to be all or nothing. I can either have something go into my activity feed where I lose it, or I can have them email me. But what I actually want is uh, a lower volume email source. Um, I think this is especially acute in the Node community where you want tons of small modules. And uh, you know, if you have a 50, 50 module voxel project and you want to know that one commit that happened on that one module, uh, it's really easy to lose that in, in, uh, in the UI, uh, in the GitHub UI. Uh, so what I have is um, an email that basically does some fancy group buys. Uh, it downloads your, your public GitHub uh, activity feed and groups by repository. Um, I'll be uh, adding in grouping by user so you can you know, see what a particular user has been doing um, uh, over time. 
Um, but yeah, uh, check this out. It'll make your uh, GitHub life a lot nicer. Um, and it's at gitstreams.com, G-I-T streams.com. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Dave Miller. I work at a company called uh, Renewable Funding. Um, we're mostly Ruby, um, but we showed up here to just kind of see the culture and, um, and learn about the Node ecosystem. Um, <clears throat> so two years ago, uh, Bike Palooza, which is a Portland um, summer bike festival um, with a lot of different rides, there was a ride around a neighborhood called Lad's Dition. And the... Um, <clears throat> The uh, goal of the ride was to score as many points as possible. You had to start in the middle circle, where it says LC, and end there also. You got one point for every street you traversed once, and a minus one point for every street you traversed more than once. Uh, and it was who could ride the, the, you know, score the most points in an hour. <coughs> um, <coughs> so... I didn't actually make the ride, um, but I heard about it, and I have a coworker who is a graph theory uh, fan and a Rubyist, and so I challenged him to a uh, code contest to solve this problem, is who could come up with the uh, highest scoring route. Um, I chose Node. I had never um, used it before, and I actually haven't used it since, um, so this code's a little stale, but, uh, <coughs> um, but I wanted to throw it up here in case there are any other beginners who want to kind of do a little interesting uh, problem. Um, <clears throat> so we, uh, Sam, my coworker in, with, with Ruby, took his approach, um, which is called depth first search. He generated, you know, random, uh, he, uh, actually not a random, but a uh, ordered walk around where he would uh, discover a legal path, which starts at the circle and ends at the circle, score it, change it slightly, score it, change it slightly again, and score it. And so it's kind of a brute force approach. What I did is um, <clears throat> took a, an atom, a randomly generated path that worked, as the fastest randomly generated path I could uh, generate, and say an Eve, and mated them. Um, this one has four children. This is the first... Uh, child, right? I can combine them based on their intersection. Here's another legal path. Here's another one. This one's not as good because it has some overlap at the end. That's minus points. And then there's this path, which is the longest path. Um, <clears throat> so one of the children um, is higher scoring one than the adults. So I would take that children, make child, make it the new adult, generate a new one, and mate them, and watch my score go up. Um, <clears throat> uh, should I tell you who won between Ruby and Node? Um, <clears throat> you can find out at this uh, URL, and you can grab the code. Um, incidentally, uh, this code has been looked at and run by maybe two or three people. Um, <clears throat> And it's probably made, uh, it's probably will end up making me a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, I happen to have a job interview. The guy looked at my GitHub repo, pulled this code, and the interview was all about going through this solution for this problem. Um, and I got an offer. My current uh, employer gave me a big raise to stay, all because of this little bike a bike a problem. So over the course of my career, I think it uh, paid off to just hack on something for, for fun. Thanks.
I said people, hire people. It's a GitHub hires people. Yeah. <laughs> or someone said Git or get out or something. Yeah. GitHub or get out, that's it. Can we up the volume a little bit, thanks? On the audio? <laughs> So I just wanted, whoops, sorry, just wanted to uh, do a little, sorry? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Just wanted to do a, a talk um, about uh, Node and enterprise software development and fostering the people and a couple of industry veterans. Um, so I just, I'm sort of a dot, dot joiner. I design applications, a product hacker, and... Um, I noticed that uh, Wood was going to be at this uh, talk uh, today, and so I drove back up from Google I.O. I'd been at Extended I.O. It was like only 669 miles, and uh, I arrived here like 12.30 last night, and um, so uh, just to like a little bit of a story here. So a friend of mine, Mike Koss, we run the uh, Google uh, Developers Group in Seattle, and Mike uh, was the uh, was the was the development manager for Outlook, amongst other things. And I don't know if I'm going to embarrass Ward right now, but hopefully not, but hopefully it's cool with this. And um, so anyways, uh, Mike was uh, wanting to, to get his team to, to, to be able to collaborate more and see what was going on with the, when they were working on Outlook in the early days. And so he created some scripts. And, uh, but the reason he created those scripts was he, he read about uh, Wiki, and he was following Ward very closely. And anyway, there's a little bit here on the Ward's uh, Wiki Wiki site, um, and it, I made a Bitly link that you can read some more on it. It's called uh, I made the link the, the Bitly link Ward Trek, not Star Trek, but Ward Trek. And um, but there's a little story behind this in terms of you know linking Wiki Wiki to SharePoint to, to Federated Wiki and sustainability. And I was at the um, Internet Identity Conference last week, and I noticed everybody's sort of working on personal cloud but got all this identity stuff with no schematic, no product. And it was just like a use, all this identity stuff looking for a use case. And I think we have a very good use case. And so a, a company that I'm helping in Indonesia, these guys are like experts in uh, textile dyeing. And um, so who's, who's basically, everybody's got sneakers, yeah? Everybody's got uh, sneakers. And you, you don't want to have white sneakers, you want to have like a colored sneaker. But when you color the sneaker, that uh, can also pollute the water. So you've got to make sure you've got clean water. And uh, how do we do this? Well, we have to sample the water. So guess what? People use these old antiquated forms. This is what they're still using today to, 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 to try and measure the water and try and give, give some information to people like Nike and Adidas and New Balance about this is the, this is the water. And uh, it struck me that uh, in order to keep the water you know, sustainable and clean, we really ought to be using more of these um, more modern technologies than... than um, so um, we need to, in, in my mind, be using products like uh, Wads Federated Wiki to create small applications that are much more... Um, uh, that, that can coexist in, in large organizations instead of big SAP apps to collect uh, d data elements in order to collect little data and turn it into big data. And so... There's basically hundreds of, and thousands of these uh, mid-sized mid manufacturers around the world who uh, need to get data into some sort of a big, big data system, and they don't really have a system to do that. They've got, they don't really use wikis, and they try to use SharePoint, but they need something that's sort of middle of the road, something that's a little bit different. Anyways, I think uh, I, was in, I was pretty showing some fun, and people were really taken by that. So I just want to give some props to Ward. And uh, that was it. Thanks.
There we go. So my name is Rob Kaur, and uh, I have a game that I am mid-development in, which is called Constant Sale, and it is all based in Node. So server side and client side, it's all JavaScript. Um, it's using MongoDB on the back end. Um, and it has, um, I use jQuery mobile as kind of the layout for the system. Um, and it's a pirate game. So you can sail around and uh, sync your friends. It's a massive multiplayer game. So here I'm going to have uh, set up uh, two web browsers, Safari and Chrome, uh, each running it at the same time. Uh, so basically simulating two different users. Um, and so there we go. Um, and I did this uh, initially uh, using PHP, uh, but it was really too slow, so I switched over to Node.js on the server. It's kind of like a real-time game, so uh, it's constantly polling and trying to get information. Um, I experimented with Comet for a while uh, using like Socket.io, uh, um, WebSockets, um, stuff like that, but um, I'm trying to aim more towards mobile, and it didn't really work out too well. Um, I also uh, was using uh, the Canvas HTML5 element, which doesn't uh, seem to work too well on iOS since uh, it doesn't take advantage of the hardware acceleration for 3D, so it um, paints out pixels. So instead, I'm using just CSS sprites um, to move things around. If you see on the right-hand side, I got one user logged in. Left-hand side, I'll have another user logged in um, in a moment. So this game allows you to sail around a ship. Uh, there is wind, as you can see by the little cloudy thing coming on the back of the ship there. Uh, you can't sail into the wind very easily. It slows you down quite a bit. Um, here comes the next player. So we got Node uh, PDX against Rob Core here. Um, you'll never guess who will win. Um, so, so there's a little anchor button you can click on. You can click anywhere on the screen, and it will actually turn your ship to point towards the direction that you're actually going. Um, this is just using straight up just polling against the server. There's no uh, web sockets going on at the moment. Um, and um, and in the game, you can sail around. Um, basically. Uh, I use the same algorithms on the front end and the back end for the plotting out of the course of the ship. So um, since it's all using JavaScript, I can easily say, OK, I haven't gotten an update from the server yet as to where my ship is going to be. Um, I'm using the same code on the front end as, as the back end as the <laughs> server, so I can predict what the server is going to tell me. So before I even get my update, I can already have the ships moving into that position, um, which is kind of nice. So, one of the problems is when you actually kill a ship, um, the other ship just says no vision for the ship because it doesn't actually tell you that you're just, it's just like, oh, I can't get the vision for it. Um, as you sail along, it basically is getting JSON to figure out what tiles to show as you're going up on the map. Um, it uses a MongoDB database to keep track of your inventory in your ship so you have food and water and crew and all. Um, you can also, buy and sell goods and ports, so there's an economic model going on. Um, so we're going to have the guy on the left, uh, he's going to be buying some stuff, and uh, he's going to try and buy some tobacco. Um, the guy on the right, who was, his ship was destroyed, I just reloaded the browser. He has a new ship now, so when you lose a ship, you, you get a new one at the beginning. Um, going to sell some cocoa beans because it turned out I didn't have any tobacco. And basically, it's just doing like Ajax request for this and saying, you know, and you can see at the bottom there's a little checkout button. Um, and it's designed for all different types of platforms. Um, so it, this is not really all that interesting since it's going to sell to the next port and sell the goods and make a little profit. Um, I'm also developing a real time uh, strategy game as well, kind of like a StarCrafty type game which is called RTS-API. Um, it's designed not to have a GUI so much. It's designed so that users can design their own GUI. Um, and it just works on API calls to find what units you have available, give them orders, and so on. And also be able to put JavaScript code into the, the actual units so they can actually control themselves and kind of make a StarCraft game where you can uh, 
have the units acting intelligently. And then there's going to be a whole communications thing where you won't be able to communicate to units directly far afield and they have to act on their own. So that's going to be a, the next game that I'm actually working on. Um, you can see these are all the massive different ships that you can actually buy in the game as you start to progress up and get more and more money. Um, I think I can skip to the end. Or not. But yeah, does anyone have any questions at all? Where do you get your assets? Are you creating them? Um, all of the tile assets are from, uh, what's it? It's FreeCiv, which is a free civilization clone. And uh, the images for the ships I took from the 3D warehouse from Google, which you can basically download 3D models from. And then I just rotated them using like a little Ruby script and then created uh, PNG images for all of the different angles that the ship could be in. And then um, I think at a certain point I had it where it would tween and like it would twist the image a little bit. So, so even though I only have 45 degree angles, the little in-between angles were filled in on the client side when you're actually running the app. So you download the, pic the one image and that will give you at least a few degrees of rotation. Okay. One more. Okie doke. So, um, hi there. My name's Isaac. I am. Uh, I work for Andyet, um, and one of uh, one of my teammates uh, made this really cool um, little. It's a uh, how many, how many people use client-side templating in their apps? Like with mustache, JS, and that kind of thing? Okay. Um, so Templatizer is a client-side um, templating engine that instead of sending the template engine to the client, this creates a, a JavaScript function that will build the HTML on the client without sending the entire engine down. So you basically, uh, it, it, it spins up, uh, well, I'll just show you. So. Um, so here we've got uh, just a regular Express app, but instead of rendering on the server, we're obviously rendering on the, on the client. Um, and here we take um, our, our entire folder of, um, of Jade templates, and we run it through Templatizer, which will then spit out one JavaScript file with all of, the, all of those um, templates as, as just functions. So this is, this is the output, um, and it will just, uh, so here's all of our, all of our Jade views. Um, simply as JavaScript functions that will will return um, a string of the HTML. So then, in our um, in our views, we uh, if we want to render a specific bit, a, a specific Jade file, uh, we just require template um, templates, and then uh, we can call each one of those Jade views as a as a direct JavaScript function, and it will just re we can pass it in any uh, any data that we want. And then it will just return that HTML string. And we can pop it into the DOM. So, anyhow, it's really uh, if you just Google Templatizer, it'll come up. It's Henrik Yorteng's GitHub account, um, and I would encourage you to check it out. The biggest thing about it is that we've run tests, and it's six to ten times faster um, on on the client uh, than than Mustache.js, and and if you're downloading the entire template engine. So, um, so really improved uh, apparent load speeds. Um, which I think is is really is really exciting. So, anyhow, thank you very much. <laughs>